Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another episode of the Boost Your Biology podcast. I'm your host, Lucas, and today I have a special guest in with me, somebody that I've looked up to for quite some time. I've been, I've been stalking a lot of his posts on, on Reddit for, for a number of years mm-hmm. now and have actually learned a lot, like quite a lot, and not just in um, specific niches, but just general biology and understanding the human body. So I really want to welcome Georgie Dinkov to the show. So yeah, thanks for joining in, Georgie. Hi, everybody. Awesome. So I guess maybe we can start out by giving a little bit of a background into how you got into researching uh, health in general. Um, it actually started, for me, started as a hobby uh, about, at this point, about 18 years ago. Uh, I was fresh out of college uh, around 2002, and that was just after the dot-com crash. Um, and I, I, my, my degree from college was in computer science, so it really was not a good time to be looking for a job with this kind of degree. Um, and I tried really hard, but uh, basically there was nothing there in terms of full-time jobs. And because when I came to the United States, I came in as a foreign student, in order to be allowed to stay in the country, you would have to find a full-time job, otherwise they'll kick you out, uh, you have to leave. Um, so the only thing that I was able to find was a um, uh, was a basically a full-time internship at a biomedical research facility called the National Biomedical Research Foundation. Um, and they were basically creating these websites uh, where people, it was like a search engine for protein sequences. Um, so I was one of the people hired to do the actual coding. Um, and there was a lot of like algorithm implementation for search, for string searching, string matching and things like that. Um, so... While initially it was purely an IT job for me, basically I was surrounded and, and, and wor- worked for about three years uh, with some of the brightest biochemists, doctors, and biologists uh, that were uh, really worldwide renowned. Um, and they were in the DC area. Some of them came from the National Institutes of Health. Others came from, um, uh, from an uh, uh, institute in Switzerland uh, as, as guest scientists. And basically, very soon, um, there was only three IT people, and we kept going out to, like, uh, happy hours and drinking and parties with, um, with all of these medical-minded people. And if you want to fit in, you have to kind of speak the lingo. So they would all, always talk about their biology stuff, and, you know, I would sit there with my geek buddies and we'd talk about computers, but, you know, neither one is interested in what the other group has to say, and they're grossly outnumbering us. So I kind of took an interest, and I said, okay, so... Um, uh, it's fascinating. I want to learn more about the human body and how things work. Uh, where do I start? And even back in 2002, the, the response was kind of, uh, you don't really need to go to school for that anymore. Um, almost everything is online at this point. So they recommend a couple of books. There was a uh, book on endocrinology that for medical students. There was an introductory book in, uh, in biochemistry also for medical students. Um, and then there, was, there were a few other books that they recommended, one on neurology and one on physiology. So I, I kind of read these books, and then they said, uh, you know, these, like I formed closer relationships with maybe four or five of these medical professionals that are in, the, in, the, in that outfit. And they kept saying, look, we give seminars and talks all the time uh, as part of, I mean, you know, we help out to build this website because we have this grant from the government, but really our job, or our daily job is to teach. So why don't you show up and start, you know, um, all, they call it auditing. They're, you know, you're, you're sitting there and with the other students, but you're not taking the exams and you're not getting a grade, but you're sitting there and basically learning if you want as, as much as the other students do. So I did that between 2002 and 2005. So um, I guess I, I read, you know, uh, the, the equivalent of like a reading material for like at least two years of medical school. Um, and then I attended quite a few seminars that these people were giving on a variety of topics. And after that, I found a job in the IT sector. Uh, but at this point, I had an interest. So I said, so what do I do? They said, look, uh, without a degree, you're not going to be able to do anything more serious because nobody's going to give you money to do, to do your research if you have no credentials. But in terms of knowledge, they're saying you already have the background, so all you really need at this point is start reading PubMed. Uh, and I said, and, and I said, that's it. They're like, yeah. I mean, but it's in this from this point on, um, whatever research it is that you want to do, you just have to keep learning, 
whatever niche in the biochemistry world you decide to uh, explore. And then all the experimental result, results are published on PubMed. Just keep reading. So I kept reading and reading and reading. And around 2008 and, or like or nine, the beginning of 2009, um, I decided to embark on the, low, the notorious low-carb diet. Um, don't ask me why. Uh, I mean, I uh, read some studies that said it was a cool thing to do. And keep in mind, that's probably about five to ten years before the low carb diet became really like the hot thing to do. Yeah. Um, so I embarked on this almost next to zero carb diet. Um, I was an avid athlete in college. I was a, a rower, rower in college, which is a type of an endurance sport. And after college, I kept running just to stay in shape. Um, and a lot of the studies on low carb basically said uh, uh, it's really, it really helps for endurance sports. So I said, oh, perfect, you know. Um, seems like something healthy to do. It will help me, may, you know, stay in shape. It will give you more energy. What's not to like? Uh, for, so for, for about three to six months, I felt really good. I actually lost weight. I was feeling great. And then I started getting these really weird neurological symptoms that uh, really freaked me out. I started getting uh, tingling and even numbing in my extremities. But it was, it was like come and go, come and go. So initially, I thought like, oh, my God, I'm having a stroke. So I went to the doctor, he's like, no, like if you had a stroke and there's an issue with a, with a, with a limb, it's not going to go away. You're basically like, you'll be paralyzed for a while, sometimes permanently. So the doctor is like, uh, let's, let's see how this goes, but I'm going to have to send you for some MRIs, see how things go. And I said, so what do I do with the low carb diet? The doctor's like, stick with it. You know, it's the best thing you can do for your health. So stupid enough, I, I stuck with it, right? And I kept running and I kept exhausting myself. Needless to say, work was extremely stressful. Um, you know, for any new immigrant in the United States, you have to prove yourself. That's just how it is. So I was working probably the equivalent of at least two jobs. Um, uh, and then, as you know, 2009 was the second recession that hit. So things got even uglier. So the combination of this extreme stress at work and what I later found out would be extreme self-imposed stress at home by running like, like a maniac, maybe six, seven miles a day, five days a week, and being on low carb diet. So these symptoms didn't go away. In fact, I started getting these chronic headaches. Um, I started getting like insomnia. I started getting anxiety. Um, and once the doctor heard about the headaches, he's like, that's it, I'm sending you for an MRI. Sounds like, you know, something might maybe going on. Um, so MRI thankfully came back clean. Um, so I went back to the doctor and he's like, um, you know, the MRI is clean, so technically I cannot give you a diagnosis, but he's like, your symptoms are consistent with something we call multiple sclerosis. So I'm like, so, so what's that? He's like, well, it is a chronic de de demyelinating disease, and basically the symptoms are numbness, weakness in the extremities, anxiety, uh, basically sometimes cognitive difficulties, trouble sleeping, um, you know, basically um, uh, easily fatigued. I was starting to get fatigued at the time. So I'm like, oh my God, that, that sounds really bad. He's like, yeah, I mean, basically, uh, there are several kinds of this, several types of multiple sclerosis. And, you know, if you're getting the one that's remit and relapsant, that's the uh, mildest version. But if you're getting the secondary progressive or primary progressive, most people are in a wheelchair within five years um, of like, the diagnosis. So I said, the hell with that. Uh, I'm, you know, I really don't want, I'm not looking forward to this. So then I started searching online what can what can alleviate and then for whatever reason i typed aspirin multiple sclerosis and one of dr pete's articles popped up so i just clicked on it i read it and something in me just just it's like a light bulb that went, went off so it just it just read right so i i basically look at the website i saw that it's one of many other articles i went back to the previous page i read all 30 in one day and, and I said, this guy is really onto something. He may not be, because I already had the, the, the background in biochemistry, and he, he had both the contrarian view, and also what really drew me to it was the energetic viewpoint, which seemed to have been neglected by almost every doctor that I talked to. Now, I go to the doctor and say, listen, I'm having an energy problem. I, I am fatigued all the time. I can't sleep. Uh, when I sleep, I don't feel rested when I wake up. So something is going on with me that gives me this fatigue. They say, no, it's just a symptom of the disease. Um, it's really not, not a problem in, in and of itself. So it's a result of the disease, but it's not a cause. And here is this guy, Dr. Pete, saying, no, actually, it's very much the cause of the structural changes that some people call multiple sclerosis. There are many diseases, right? So modern medicine says, 
you can either have a structural disorder or a functional disorder. So they'll do everything in their power to find what your structural disorder may be. That includes imaging, uh, biopsies, blood tests, uh, you know, physical examinations, all of these things. And if nothing comes back as abnormal, but you're still feeling crappy, they'll, they'll say it's, it's a functional disorder. It's not a structural one. Well, this functional disorder cannot be coming out of nowhere. Something must be behind it. So, so either, so if you guys haven't found the structural disorder yet, but it, it is there, or it's actually the other way around. Maybe it's the functional disorder that precedes the, those structural abnormalities that are coming, that are, that are materializing later on. And doctor people are saying it's the latter, right? Uh, it's basically, it's the functional uh, deterioration, which is driven by energetic deficiency, which ultimately starts changing the structure of the body. And there's a very good analogy, which uh, I think he gave in one of his interviews. I like to use it all the time. Is the, if you go to the doctor, regular doctor, the, the analogy that they have of the human body is like a car. So you have a car, and if it's, it's a structure, if it's a structurally sound car, then it doesn't really matter what kind of fuel you put in the engine. The car may go slower or faster, but it, the, even if you put crappy fuel, it's not going to damage the actual car, right? It's not going to make uh, like a door fall off, or it's not going to it's not going to give it a flat tire, right? Well, in, it, as it turns out in biochemistry, in biology, especially human physiology, it's actually that analogy no longer works. You, the structure of your car, meaning the car being your body, your organism, equally depends on the energy and the efficiency with which the energy is being produced. To get, so uh, like a better example would be, so the cell, in order for the cell to maintain itself, not only alive, but structurally sound, it needs to produce a sufficient amount of energy because the cell is a self-repairing mechanism. It doesn't have a mechanic which you can take the car to and say, oh, uh, the cell is leaking, let's, let's stitch it up and it will be fine. Uh, sometimes you have a room, you can do that, but at the cellular level, the cell has mechanisms for self-repair, but all of those mechanisms require energy. And if you don't have the energy, the cell starts to physically deteriorate, structurally deteriorate, with the ultimate result being sometimes the cell dies and leaks its contents into the bloodstream. So very quickly, you know, after having now the background in biochemistry, I started researching these ideas and I found out that there is an ocean of contrarian science that for some reason is very rarely making the public mainstream, especially the medical publications, but it's there. It's not, it's not hidden. It's just not talked about, right? If you go to PubMed and search any of these topics that we're about to discuss, you will find tons and tons and tons of studies some of them are older, yes, and there's no, there's no arguing about that, but they have not been reclaimed, they have not been retracted, and they have not been falsified. So until then, I think, it's, I think modern medicine is really doing a disservice, and at this point I would probably be go as far as to call it fraud, by discussing all of our problems as if there's only one true pathway which has never been challenged. That's not how, and most people of your listeners who have done science, they know that typically in science, you always have a few major hypotheses that are always competing for dominance, right? But for some reason in medicine, over the last 50 to actually even 100 years, we have never heard the challenging hypothesis to the mainstream, which is the genes are the determinants of your destiny. If anything goes wrong with you, unless it's a trauma, which, you know, caused by some kind of a blood force, everything else is driven by some kind of genetic uh, dysfunction or disorder. So the key to health is to find which genes are responsible, and then we maybe silence them if they're the bad genes, or if they're good ones, then we you know uh, uh, activate them, right? Or if there's some gene that's, that has mutated, like in cancer cells, because they keep claiming cancer is a genetically driven disease, then we maybe use our latest and greatest genetically gene editing techniques like CRISPR, and we remove that gene and replace it with something else. So still the old mechanical car analogy. Something's wrong structurally with the car and we're going to fix it, but that's not how the cell works. If the cell is not producing energy well, no matter how you repair it, as soon as that repair process is done and you walk away, the cell will continue to deteriorate because it cannot maintain itself. Yes, you can help it externally by maybe doing something structural, some structural help, but unless you fix the energetic problem, the functional side of the story, uh, health will not be restored. So the, the ultimate message, I think, from Dr. Pete's writings is that structure and function cannot be separated, and they intimately depend on each other. So bad function generates bad structure, and then, then, then that bad structure 
pro propagates the, uh, it, it enables further deteriorating a function, which it enables further deteriorating a structure, and on and on it goes into a vicious cycle until it, until it is somehow interrupted. It makes no sense to speak of these of these two aspects of health separately. They're the same, the two sides of the same coin. Um, and that, that, that was the first time I heard of people speak like that, at least in the medical field, because even the brightest, these bright people that I work with at the uh, uh, biomedical option facility, they were very hardcore uh, mechanics, as I like to call them. They were medical mechanics. Um, but that's what they learned in school. That, that was their research. And, uh, you know, I'm grateful that at least they showed me, they said, you know, how and where I can learn more about it. But since then, since this was a circa 2009, 2010, when I discovered Dr. Pete, um, I've been reading all of, I've read all of his work, every interview, every publication, all of his books, and, uh, uh, you know, thousands of other studies on top of that. And to me, the picture at this point is very clear. Not only is, is he right, but it's not him being right. He simply synthesized in a really good and accessible way this tremendous amount of contrarian evidence that we have never been told about. Uh, and I don't know if it's our fault for never asking the questions, because I think we have, but we've always been reassured, like, don't worry about it. The experts are handling. Well, how many chronic diseases have we cured over the last 100 years? Zero. How many cancer cases have we truly cured? Zero. When you go to a doctor and you have cancer, and, you know, they start treating you, um, even if, uh, like, let's say you have a mild, let's say, stage one, right? So you basically go through these procedures, the tumor disappears, and then they tell you for the next five years, you're in remission, you're not cured. So after five years, they, 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 they qualify you, they classify you as cured, but the doctor tells you it can always come back. The exact same tumor can always come back. Well, why doctor? You told me I'm cured. Well, we can never guarantee that some cancer cell has not remained somewhere dormant and then you know, they, that, that it will not restart the same process in the future. And Dr. P is saying, the problem is that you guys, meaning the doctors, are treating cancer as an isolated tissue-specific disease. Of course, it can come back. You know why? Because the problem is systemic. The cancer is simply the symptom of the systemically deranged metabolism, which manifests itself in the organ that just happens to be the most energetically deranged. If you have a, a liver issue, and then your metabolism chronically declines over time, chances are if you deliver, if you develop some kind of a cancer and the liver is the weakest part, you'll probably get liver cancer, right? Um, and the same thing goes with bone, skin, brain, lung, colon, you name it, cancers. Um, it really depends on which organ has endured the most assault. It's not a coincidence that chronic alcoholics have a rate of, of liver cancer that is several hundred times higher than the general population. How's that for genetically determined disease? Um, I mean, what are, they, are all alcoholics somehow genetically deranged mutants that are susceptible to liver cancer independently of their drinking? No. Any sane person will see the two and two and put them together and say, oh, four. Guess what? It's probably the, the chronic alcoholism that is leading to this, to this liver cancer. And now medicine is slowly starting to recognize that, but it's really, for them, it's always an uncomfortable discussion because... To them, cancer is the result of a cell that has mutated and has become cancerous, and then that's why it has a deranged metabolism. So the structure changed first, and then the, the functional disorder came later. And in Dr. Pete's uh, writings, and really the metabolic theory teachings, it's the exact opposite. It's the chronic assault on function, which is the, the production of energy, that ultimately has led to a derangement in structure, and, and basically, that's what we call cancer. So it's, cancer is a symptom of bad metabolism, of assault from suboptimal environment, of chronic stress, um, of exposure to carcinogens, you name it. It's the result of all of these things, one or more, right? Not the other way around. Um, to this day, there is no proof. So science cannot create an animal model that is genetically somehow guaranteed to develop cancer. They have some models that are more likely to develop the cancer, but even then they cannot isolate a specific gene that is responsible for the development of cancer. They have these strains of rats, they call them spontaneously hypertensive rats, or like um, uh, restart rats that are uh, uh, type 2 diabetic. So basically they're, they've modified their, their genome to make them more susceptible to develop these diseases, right? But they don't talk about which gene specifically 
they have modified to be responsible for that. They talk about like a group of genes. And by the way, if you go and look, the genes that are usually modified to produce the diabetes are actually disease, uh, the genes involved in fatty acid metabolism. So, uh, you know, in mainstream medicine will tell you a thousand times over that, that diabetes is a sugar disease. Limit your sugar and you'll be fine. Yet, in animal research, the models, the, the animal models that have been genetically modified to reliably produce diabetes, not always, not guaranteed, but increase the chance of it, their genes that have been modified are the ones that actually increase the synthesis of fats and the oxidation of fats. Not Nothing to do with sugar. So, I've actually talked to several doctors about this, and the response is always, we're not rats. Like, how can you use this as an example to, to, this, to this justify the claim that, you know, diabetes is somehow uh, a fat disease? I'm like, well, almost every type 2 diabetic that I know is severely obese. Uh, so let's start with that. That obesity on them is accumulated fat. Well, that's because they eat too much sugar. I don't think so. I mean, I know plenty of people who eat high-carb, low-fat diets. They don't get fat. It's usually the combination of high fat and high carb diets that lead to this rapid obesity, and not just any type of fat, but the type of fat that produces a chronic inflammatory response, which the PUFA, the polyunsaturated fats, are known for. They are the main precursors of the inflammatory mediators of the body. The pharmaceutical industry has spent billions of dollars developing drugs that inhibit the enzymes that synthesize inflammatory mediators from the polyunsaturated fats. Well, let's take it a step further. Why, instead of developing these drugs that inhibit enzymes, why not just limit the intake of PUFA, which will also have the effect of decreasing inflammation? The response you get is, you can do that. The, the PUFA are essential. Without them, you die. Show me the evidence. Oh yeah, here is the study from the 1930s. One study by a guy called Burr and his wife who did one study with rats to, to basically see what happens if you deprive these rats of the polyunsaturated fats in the diet and you gave them fully saturated fats. So these rats became lean and their, their metabolic rate doubled. They couldn't get these rats to become obese even though they fed them the calorie equivalent of four rats a day. <laughs> so, so imagine instead of eating 2,000 calories, you eat 8,000 to 10,000 calories a day, and you continue losing weight. That's how fast their metabolism became. But they also noticed some symptoms such as dry skin, cracking skin, um, and basically really high body temperature, right? These are all, yes, uh, undoubtedly uh, signs of high metabolism, but it's because when you increase the metabolic rate, that also increases your need, your dietary need, for all of the cofactors that go into maintaining that body. So if you have now have the metabolism that can metabolize 8,000 calories a day, guess what? You will need to increase pro rata your intake of minerals and vitamins and other nutrients probably at least four times to what you were taking before. And if you don't, which is what they did with those poor rats, then of course these rats are going to develop nutritional deficiencies. But those rats still were extremely resilient and they had a very hard time killing them because almost every animal experiment uh, that tries to assess toxicity and or changes in health eventually ends up with the animals being killed by either like a blood force trauma or like bleeding them or giving them like some kind of a suffocating gas. Well, guess what? I think they try to kill them with some kind of a gas like carbon dioxide. The rats would just not die. They, were, they actually had this uh, in the study, a uh, commenter to the study saying that the rats were extremely resilient to sacrifice. So I thought, wow. Well, that isn't that the ma shouldn't that be a major finding of the study? Uh, guess what? We uh, removed the poofa from the diet, and these rats became impossible to kill. I think most humans would be interested in uh, in being like that, right? Especially given the current situation with the virus and everything else going around. But we don't hear that. And guess what? Since the 1930s, no other study has been done to replicate the findings of that study. This, the study was taken completely as 100% true, and something so important was based on a single study, and to make matters worse, we're now finding that the same thing was done for cholesterol, the same thing was done for the, for the, for the studies linking sugar to cardiovascular disease, the famous key studies from the 70s, the same thing was done for the studies linking saturated fat to cardiovascular disease. All of these major public health decisions policies really, because now the official dietary recommendations are avoid saturated fat, avoid cholesterol, increase unsaturated fats in the diet, right? All of these things 
um, because you're gonna you'll be healthier, you'll have less risk of a cardiovascular disease. All of these turns out to have been based on nothing but a handful of studies, most of them done in the 1950s to the early 1970s, and no replication since then. And for some of them, no no replication ever, right? The the Birch study um, uh, from the 1930s. Uh, claiming that PUFA is essential has never been replicated. Why would you base public health policy affecting billions of people around the world on a single study without even bothering just to say, look, everybody makes mistakes. Maybe you guys picked this pe uh, peculiar uh, like uh, breed of rats. Maybe you had the bad lighting in the, in the lab. Maybe they did not like you or your wife who were handling. Who knows what, what could have caused like these these uh, these side effects that they, they saw in the rats? Just 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 so we know whether I mean you should always replicate results studies that are that are used for such uh, wide-reaching public health policies. It was never done. So here we are. Basically, at this point, the, the the claim of the official mainstream medicine is: do not eat saturated fat. Uh, replace as much as possible the saturated fat with unsaturated fats, and preferably the polyunsaturated fats. Not even the monounsaturated, which is found in things like olive oil and avocado. They say, no, that's not unsaturated enough. You need to do even more unsaturated, like the type of oils found in sunflower oil and all kinds of seed oils, because the more unsaturated the fat is, the, the, the greater its effects on lowering cholesterol. Ooh, the evil cholesterol, right? The, that now it turns out that FDA reversed it's 50 year long standing on dietary cholesterol. Uh, last year, the FDA, the American agency responsible for setting up public health policy, which becomes almost like a law, said you, you no longer need to avoid dietary cholesterol. It has no link to, to heart disease. That's after 50 years fear mongering saying, take your statins. If you don't take your statins, if you don't bring your cholesterol under control, you're gonna develop heart disease. And guess what? Just like that with one decision, not very widely publicized, but it's there, if you search for it, if you search in Google, FDA reverses standing on cholesterol, you'll find it. So there we are. I mean, it turns out 50 years of public health policy was not only wrong, it likely led to the unnecessary and early death of uh, tens of millions of people, if not more. Yeah, wow. There's a, there's a lot to a lot to unpack there, but I really want to yeah. um, delve sort of back into a little bit onto onto um, Dr. Ray Pete's work and his early work on understanding the energetic viewpoint and mm -hmm. and how really for my listeners because this will be all brand new to them so they they won't know much about I guess like um, you know the fact that when we ramp up metabolism we're going to be depleting nutrients so do you want to sort of discuss I know that Ray Pete's very big on optimizing thyroid function and, and I I'm yeah huge believer in that's like the critical driver for improving metabolism. So do you want to talk about how the thyroid and how like, you know, the thyroid impacts general metabolism? So the thyroid is, is sort of like the conductor, the master conductor of metabolism. Um, and very early in the 20th century, studies were, were shown, uh, studies were starting to show that there is a really strong correlation, inverse correlation between thyroid function and cardiovascular disease. The lower your thyroid function, the more susceptible you are to cardiovascular disease. And usually it coincided with the uh, rise of cholesterol, uh, gaining weight, uh, joint problems, skin problems, memory problems. So all of these things were clustering together and they were strongly associated with declining thyroid function. And I think really like the culmination of this research were, was in Brother Barnes' work, um, which was done in the, in the 50s, I think up to the 70s. Uh, who was a researcher who really put the focus on thyroid. He said, listen, there is no mystery to cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease is nothing but basically the decline of structure of the heart and the blood vessels as a result of low metabolism. And, and basically when metabolism is low, you tend to develop these low-grade inflammatory reactions uh, everywhere in the body, but specifically in the blood vessels. And the way the body tries to imperfectly protect you from this chronic inflammation because it can rupture a vessel. I mean, if the vessel is chronically inflamed, it can rupture, and then if it's a major vessel, you can die from bleeding. So the body knows that very well and tries to protect you as much as possible by plugging the really problematic areas with a combination of cholesterol and, and, and immune cells. So if you look at the plaques that are forming inside of the blood vessels, they're composed mostly 
of white blood cells and cholesterol. So that's actually one of the reasons why the cholesterol hypothesis formed. People thought, oh, it's the cholesterol that's creating the plaques. It's really the, you know, heat, it, so cholesterol is kind of clogging your veins. No, but what about the second aspect? Why didn't you guys discuss what are white blood cells doing in these plaques? This is usually a sign that there is an inflammatory reaction going on. So this thing for over 50 years was never discussed. Cholesterol was because they, they just didn't have a drug to attack the problem, but they did have the drugs to attack the cholesterol aspect. So they said, well, let's bank on cholesterol and leave the, the, the immune aspect, the inflammatory aspect. Let's leave that aside for a while. Let's take care of the cholesterol. If it doesn't work, we're going to figure it out later. Well, guess what? For 50 years, they've been battling high cholesterol and nothing has come out of it. Um, so now they're finally starting to say that, yes, cardiovascular disease is a, is a disease, or a result of chronic inflammatory process in the body, which brings us, brings immediately PUFA at the forefront, just as I mentioned earlier. Um, the two enzymes, cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase, are the enzymes responsible for creating most of the inflammatory mediators using PUFA as a raw material. But guess what? PUFA is essential, makes billions of dollars in sales every year, what is fish oil or like, uh, you know, specific foods that are being produced. I mean, America produces mostly corn and soy. These are heavily government subsidized uh, crops. So as a, the, the, uh, one result of all of these crops are the seed oils, soybean oil and corn oil. Um, and guess what? The agricultural industry wants to sell it. How do you sell billions of tons of oil every year to an unsuspecting public? You convince it that it's good for it, right? So what does thyroid have to do with it? Well, when the, when the cell has a sufficient amount of energy and the amount of energy it produces uh, basically correlates, it, it's, it's controlled by thyroid. Thyroid basically determines how efficiently you use oxygen and how completely uh, the fuel from food is turned into the, this molecule, internal energetic molecule called adenosine triphosphate. Um, so without thyroid, you basically, the cell has three metabolic steps. And without thyroid, you're stuck in the first step, which is very inefficient and very ancient. Um, even amoebas and, and bacteria and very primitive slimes, like kind of organisms, multicellular organisms have it. Uh, it's called glycolysis. And basically the glycolysis is a very inefficient way of producing energy from food. And the resulting, so it produces very little ATP, but it consumes a lot of oxygen. And then one, one output of the glycolysis, excessive glycolysis, is lactic acid. So if you have the three steps, which are glycolysis, Krebs cycle, and electron transfer chain, those are the three steps of the metabolism. If you have only the first one working, glycolysis, you're producing very low amount of energy uh, so, and producing a lot of lactic acid, which lactic acid itself is a toxic molecule. The body doesn't like it, tries to get rid of it as soon as it's produced. But more importantly, if you're not producing sufficient amount of energy, just as I mentioned earlier, it leads to structural degradation over time, leads to inflammatory processes, because one way uh, the body uh, tries to repair damage is basically triggering a localized immune, uh, inflammatory reaction, which awakens the immune system, and basically the immune system starts sending all of these cells in that, in that direction where the inflammation is coming from, trying to repair it. But in order to repair the damage, all, a lot of these primitive growth processes are being triggered um, and to, to synthesize new tissues, new cells, new machinery for the cells, DNA, RNA, enzymes, uh, everything that the cell needs. And unfortunately, if, if that growth process is not inhibited, uh, which also requires energy, eventually you get uncontrolled growth, which is the hallmark of cancer. And it just so happens that cancer cells can only uh, produce energy through glycolysis. So it, it, a recent study came out, it's not very recent, about four years ago, which uh, one, of the, one of the leading cancer biologists in the United States, actually the world really, was a team of three of them, who wrote an editorial article in the journal Nature and said, we've been looking at cancer the wrong way. Cancer is not a mutated disease. Cancer is simply a reversal to a very primitive state of metabolism when a sufficiently large group of cells becomes convinced the, 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 the sophisticated way of metabolizing, which maintains structure, which is the Krebs cycle and electron transfer chain, are no longer working. So if sufficient number of cells gets damaged or is under stress and is not allowed to metabolize food properly through the three steps fully, then eventually you get a sufficient group of cells that form a quorum and are saying, 
things are really bad, the environment is really suboptimal, we should uh, dispose of most of our higher functionality and instead of, let's say, liver cells doing whatever liver cells do, the liver cells are now saying, no, we need to re replicate and grow because we are going to, we're going to ensure survival by increasing numbers. And usually the body says, no, actually, I can ensure survival by having these highly specialized cells doing whatever they, they're supposed to be doing in that organ and not being concerned too much with growth, right? But if you don't have the energy, if you have a suboptimally functioning organism, the way the organism uh, thinks it will survive is by increasing its numbers. Um, and actually, it works at the society level, too. Multiple studies have shown that people that live in really uh, like stressful cultures, stressful environments, tend to have a lot more children than people who live in much more um, benign, uh, positive, beneficial cultures because it's, I guess it's an instinct, instinct right? Uh, if, you're, if you think you're not going to live very long and life will be short and brutal, then you, if you want to pro procreate, if you want to maintain your, your bloodline, you will have a lot more kids, right? Because you don't expect all of them to survive either. And that's how it has been for the world for the, you know, really all the way up until maybe 100 years ago which with the advance of antibiotics, improved sanitation, improved food production, uh, you know, finally a good portion of, of the population of the world decided to have maybe two, three kids instead of 12 or more. Um, so really the analogy here is the same way. Basically the thyroid is what controls, allows the cell to go beyond glycolysis, go beyond the primitivism, beyond the stage of growth and division, and then allow it to produce sufficient energy so it can differentiate. In other words, it can become the specialized and benign acting type of cell that makes a liver, the lung, spleen, intestine, brain, skin, whatever. So what really keeps us humans and in the shape of a human is thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is the great orchestrator of inhibiting growth, of uh, actually channeling growth in a creative way, because the body is constantly renewing itself, is constantly producing cells and constantly shedding them. So if for whatever reason these new cells that are being produced, if they're not being channeled in the proper direction to become specific organs, right, and, and well-functioning, which requires a three steps of metabolism, which requires thyroid, these cells have nothing else to do except grow and replicate. And that's how you get the cancer. Fascinating, fascinating stuff there. <clears throat> so maybe, um... In terms of thyroid function, I know there'll be people that are listening in and they're probably wondering, I guess, maybe strategies to optimize thyroid function. And we know the obvious one is to reduce puffers and um, to replenish B vitamin status and all the nutrients and things like that. But what else either like promotes thyroid function or hinders thyroid function? So thyroid function has been known to be inversely correlated with adrenal function. Um, and positively correlated with gonadal function. And if it's, a, if it's inversely correlated with adrenal function, this automatically means stress inhibits thyroid, right? So, so anything that promotes adrenal function, no matter what it is, even if it's a positive type of stress, anything that raises cortisol or any of the other mediators on the cortisol pathway. So the, usually when you're under stress, the brain produces something called corticotropin releasing hormone, CRH. And then that is a signal for the pituitary to start producing another hormone called ACTH, adrenal corticotropin releasing hormone. Now that ACTH starts circulating in the bloodstream. The adrenals have these receptors for it. So in other words, they, they pick up that signal from the blood and say, oh, you're under stress, I need to produce cortisol. Because the function of cortisol, it really has two major functions. One is to maintain the, the blood sugar levels at all costs, because your brain consumes about 40% of your daily calories and really of the calories of the, of the energy that the body produces, this means that the, that the brain, which prefers to burn sugar, this means the blood sugar needs to be maintained high. No, I'm not sure how many of your uh, listeners know diabetic people, but diabetic people can almost, uh, they can go in a color like a heartbeat if their blood sugar drops too quickly. So the usually diabetic people always carry with themselves both insulin and glucose tablets. Because if they start feeling lightheaded and if like they're about to pass out, they immediately put a, a glucose tablet under their tongue. Well, the great regulator of blood sugar, meaning keeping it you know, relatively high, uh, is cortisol. Uh, and cortisol and insulin have this like inverse relationship. Basically, the purpose of, of insulin is to lower blood glucose because it's allowing the tissues to 
to basically uh, extract it from the bloodstream and metabolize it, right? And the purpose of cortisol is actually to supply more glucose into the bloodstream when you're under stress because the cortisol is trying to protect your vital organs, mostly the brain, because without brain you die, and your heart and your lungs by maintaining a, a, at least a baseline uh, level of blood glucose. But how does he do that? Well, if you're not eating um, or if you've exhausted the glycogen stores, which is they're mostly stored in the liver and a little bit in the muscles, then, then the, the body needs glucose from somewhere, right? And that somewhere can only come from other tissues. And most of the tissues are composed of protein, of amino acids. And the role of cortisol, second biggest role, is to basically, as you should say, right, the, still may, related to blood glucose levels, is to shed or shred, really, these tissues and turn them into amino acids, which then travel to the liver, and they're converted to glucose through the process of gluconeogenesis. Now, I think it's already... You know, the, the, the fact that I said that cortisol shreds your tissues, your soft tissues, is already a good indication that's probably not something you want to, to be happening all the time. Uh, it can really, like, it can, like, truly melt you away in a matter of days if you're under extreme stress. Even bones, uh, basically, uh, cortisol is a very powerful osteolytic agent. Uh, it can give you, like, really thin-looking limbs. People with Cushing syndrome which is a, a, a disease of cortisol, cortisol excess, they're very fat in the, mid, in the middle of the trunk and they're extremely thin um, extremities. So it's called, it's called the lemon and sticks uh, model. So they really look like a lemon with like, you know, four sticks sticking out. And, and that's what cortisol does. So it, it, and I gave you this analogy because I wanted to point out that another um, uh, uh, result of cortisol excess is the synthesis of fat. So, so, th so that's how you need to see the, the opposite um, activities and effects of cortisol and thyroid. So cortisol will destroy your lean tissue and bones, but it will make you accumulate fat. Uh, and at the same time, it will keep the, blood, the levels of blood sugar high, which also means insulin will be high because if the blood sugar levels are starting to rise, the body is trying to protect against that as well. So it will jack up insulin as well. So every time you have high cortisol, you're likely to also have high insulin. Um, and, um, you know, many people have now start, uh, not, many people are now starting to make the claim that maybe we're looking at diabetes the wrong way. It's not really type 2 diabetes. It's not really a, a disease of excess insulin, but something else is going on. Well, that something is excess cortisol. And there are actually clinical trials with drugs that block the effects of cortisol and the receptor, and they can reverse type 2 diabetes in a matter of a week. How, do you, have you heard of any other intervention that can reverse type 2 diabetes in a week? Apparently it's there, and the studies are published. They're human studies. They're not even, there are with rats, there, there, are, there are some with, with mice, there are some with dogs and cats and monkeys, and now we have a clinical trial with humans. And the response of mainstream medicine still is, oh, it's a multifactorial problem. It's very difficult, very complex. We don't know what exactly is causing type 2 diabetes. We'll start with the obvious. If it doesn't work, then we're going to worry about if it's something more complicated or not. Um, so really, basically, anything that raises cortisol or CRH or ACTH immediately has the effect of dampening the synthesis of thyroid hormone in your thyroid gland. Uh, to make matters worse, because the thyroid gland produces mostly T4, which is actually a precursor to the active thyroid hormone. The, the active one is T3. So that T4 that the thyroid gland produces, so it's released into the bloodstream and, and travels around and eventually makes its way to the liver. Now, there are enzymes in the liver, uh, iodinase enzymes, that convert T4 into T3. But guess what? Cortisol inhibits those enzymes too. So if your cortisol is elevated, actually the other stress hormones do it too. Estrogen does it as well. Serotonin does it as well. ACTH, CRH, prolactin, all of these uh, stress mediators is what I like to call them, have the nasty effect of inhibiting either the synthesis of thyroid pro uh, pre-thyroid T4 in the thyroid gland or the conversion of T4 into T3 in the liver. So you're getting into this hypermetabolic state and sometimes your doctor, some, uh, sometimes at blood tests you may see the TSH being in range, yeah. but now they've actually modified the range. The normal range used to be up to six and after 70 years of claiming that this is a perfectly good range, it, it doesn't need to be modified, suddenly the American Association of, of Endocrinology lowered it to four. That's a 20% drop of the normal range and the zero coverage of this in the mainstream press. 
So, so we went from basically one third of the people that we've told them they're normal, their metabolism is normal, suddenly become hypothyroid. But that to me is like a public health disaster. I never saw any, any mainstream publication, any mainstream press, uh, like, a, like a mainstream uh, uh, media outlet to even discuss this. Um, even the specialized medical uh, uh, um, outfits that, that would cover what's happening in the medical world in a, in a more popular fashion, like Scientific American, right? Uh, 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 science Alert, uh, Science News. There are a number of different, uh, these, they're, they're, all, they're not blogs, but they're like newspapers for science. Not a single one of them uh, c had a coverage of this tremendous change uh, of public health uh, implication policy that basically said, oh my God, w w at least one third of the people that we've seen throughout all these years that we told them they're healthy, they were very serious in the chronological problem. Um, so anyways, but that's really the main takeaway from the story is uh, stress directly lowers your metabolism. Um, and basically, there are many mediators of stress. Not everybody will react in the exact same way. Some people will react to stress with elevated cortisol. Some people who have post-traumatic stress disorder yeah. and are at the stage of almost adrenal pre-adrenal failure, they cannot muster up the cortisol response. But they have other stress mediators, serotonin, estrogen, prolactin, um, growth hormone, those will be elevated and those can cause the decline in thyroid function as well. So it's really, you have to look at the systemic picture, but there are many ways to assess if somebody is in a, a chronic stress state or not. And if any of these stress mediators is elevated or at least in a range where it's known to be pathological, you can safely assume that metabolism is probably going to be uh, negatively affected. Um, and they're actually uh, really cheap and reliable ways to assess metabolic function that don't require blood tests. Uh, one of the two simplest ones are you measure your core body temperature at waking, armpit um, or mouth or ear temperature will probably be fine, but armpit temperature seems to be the most reliable. So waking temperature, if waking temperatures are not at least 97.5 to 98 degrees, chances are your metabolism is, is not where it should be. And more importantly, if your temperatures do not rise to at least 98.5 after eating breakfast, after a long night of fasting, basically, then that's also not a good sign. Heart rate is another uh, uh, great uh, indicator of thyroid function because if your levels of T3 are low or something is blocking the effects of thyroid hormone at the cellular level, which is what fats do, specifically polyunsaturated fats, um, th th then ha your heart rate is going to be low. And what do I mean by low? Below 75 beats per minute uh, at waking. Now, you know, because, you know, you're exhausted, you, you know, the, the, the glycogen is being depleted throughout the night. So it's okay to have a 75, 60 to 75 beats per minute at waking. But if you eat, then for in a healthy person, temperature will rise to at least 98 degrees and a heart rate should rise to at least 80 beats per minute. If either one of these things is not happening, your metabolism is not where it should be. Something is blocking some, some kind of a stress response, whether, whether because of the long uh, period of darkness and not eating, which is what uh, is happening throughout the night, or something else in your lifestyle is preventing metabolism from ramping up, from ramping up uh, in response to eating, to food. Um, so what else? Um, things that are endocrine disruptors. There are many things in our environment, uh, the most famous ones being BPA, uh, bisphenol A. So there are type of, if you look at the, the structure of the molecule, uh, it, it is reminiscent to the synthetic estrogens that were developed in the 60s and 70s to, uh, to treat female problems, such as uh, amenorrhea, menopause, you name it. But basically, it's two phenol molecules, that's why it's called bisphenol, and it's just they have a, a several different functional groups attached to the, to the rings. But there are actually multiple publications that show that the, these, these endocrine disruptors are really nasty because they act as thyroid hormone receptor antagonists, while simultaneously they're also estrogen receptor agonists, cortisol receptor agonists, and androgen antagonists. So they're going to block your thyroid function. They're going to act like a stress mediator. They're going to emasculate you if you're a man. And they're going to masculinize you if you're a woman, which I don't think many people would want that, right? So they're going to tank your metabolism. And guess what? They're also carcinogenic and pro-inflammatory. It's really hard to get like more nasty than that, except possibly ionizing radiation. Speaking of which, um, if you look at the rates of ionizing radiation exposure 
It's really going through the roof for the majority of the Western population. You go to a doctor for any kind of like a problem, like a cough, they're gonna say, oh, let's get an X-ray, just to make sure it's not pneumonia, right? Um, or, oh, uh, my, my, I don't know, my kneecap hurts. Oh, let's take an X-ray. Let's make sure it's not something bad. It doesn't require surgery. Every exposure to ionizing radiation counts because it turns out that this is another thing we've been lied to for almost 50 years. It turned out that the initial uh, theory that was developed in the 60s that said that uh, ionizing radiation is subject to a so-called threshold uh, principle. In other words, there's a unique threshold of danger that is different for every individual, right? But they, they kind of, they, they, they've published some guidelines that are saying, as long as you stay below this exposure level, most people are safe. Now they said, no, actually, ionizing the danger, the risk of ionizing radiation exposure is cumulative. So you can have an x-ray, you, uh, you could have had an x-ray at the age of two, and then you had another one at the age of 18, and if you just happen to be a susceptible individual, these two exposures to radiation combined were enough to set you over that critical threshold and give you cancer. And now they're saying, oh my God, yes, it is cumulative. We should limit radiation exposure, but the COVID, the COVID of interest with industry is a really big one here. I mean, there's so many CT scan machines, PET scan machines, all kinds of entire branch of medicine built around radiation. Even though an MRI and an ultrasound alone and in combination will give you just as good, if not even better, imaging results without any of the risks. Um, so, so ionizing radiation, endocrine disruptors, stress, uh, poor diet. So speaking of poor diet, the PUFAs, the polyunsaturated fats, really any type of fat tends to have a slight anti-thyroid effect, but most of the saturated fats, are, uh, they, they have a pro-metabolic effect as well. Uh, many of them are anti-estrogenic. They uh, increase both the synthesis of cholesterol and the conversion of cholesterol into downstream steroids, which is what we want. And that process happens to be declining dramatically with aging because thyroid function declines. So in older people, you tend to see high cholesterol. One of the first things, one of the greatest dis distinctions between a young person and an old person is that a young person cholesterol is really normal. In an old person, you're almost, you're almost guaranteed to see an elevated cholesterol. Some of this is adaptive, but the reason it's adaptive is the body is saying, oh my, oh, I'm not convert, I'm not synthesizing the steroids that I need in a proper in a proper amount, so I better ramp up my cholesterol synthesis to compensate for that. Um, but some of the some of the effects are also due to the diet. Uh, basically, the the replacement of saturated fat with polyunsaturated fats have, have led to uh, both a state of chronic inflammation, which hinders thyroid function. Thyroid function is actually one of the first to decline when there is an excess of inflammatory mediators in the blood. When there is when there is a sufficient amount of prostaglandins or leukotrienes, which are synthesized from PUFA, thyroid function can be almost completely shut down. More, perhaps just as importantly, even more importantly, uh, the polyunsaturated fats have the, the ability to inhibit the transport uh, of thyroid hormone to, to the cells, inhibit the uptake of thyroid hormone by the cells, and in some cases, depending on the type of polyunsaturated fat, the specific fatty acid, they may even be able to block the actual thyroid receptor in the cell. So really, PUFA is, a, in, is in its own right an endocrine disruptor, not very different from the bisphenols, mostly because the bisphenols happen to be, pre they're very potent, but luckily, uh, they're still in a relatively minor amount. I mean, it's still enough to affect us, but it's nothing compared to PUFA. PUFA we eat voluntarily and in massive amounts. So in the large doses of PUFA exposure that we get every day, uh, chances are that, that PUFA is actually a bigger, an endocrine disruptor with a bigger impact than, than the actual endocrine disruptors such as bisphenol A, uh, a and uh, many of the fluoro containing ones from like Teflon, um, and, and other plastic and, and petroleum derived products. So PUFA really is a very versatile uh, or wide acting endocrine disruptor, dietary endocrine disruptor to which everybody has access on a daily basis throughout their entire lives and usually more than once a day. I mean, they're present in almost every food, every commercial food in sufficient amounts to cause problems. So Georgie, let's sort of circle back and um discuss some of those stress mediators. So obviously you've mentioned PUFA being one of the, one of the hallmark um, stress mediators that's influencing serotonin, prolactin, right. cortisol, right. 
and obviously the low carbohydrate diet, which is also going to, you know, be detrimental to metabolism. So I guess I want to, I want to delve into, um, you mentioned that there were specific medications to actually block cortisol. And I'm familiar with mm-hmm. one of them. I've used one of them quite a lot, a ciproheptadine. And in fact, right. it was your thread that actually prompted me to ever try ciproheptadine. And it's, it's a powerful tool, in my opinion. It's a very, very powerful um, medication that needs to be used very cautiously. And obviously, this is not medical advice for those listening in. But right. in terms of ciproheptadine, do you want to sort of explain and even the anti-serotonin effect and how that influences autism. Sure. So, so another major theory which is now starting to crumble is that serotonin is the happy hormone, right? You hear this all, all the way, all the time on TV. Uh, most of the drugs for depression are being marketed as drugs that boost the serotonin system. But guess what? If you look at again, all of this is published. None of this is hidden, but it's just it's never promoted, so we don't know that it's actually a contrarian view. Is early, in the 1940s, the, the name of serotonin wasn't serotonin, but was something called enteramine. So enteramine means, means an amine produced in the intestines. So they knew as early as the 1940s that many people with cancer had an elevated synthesis of serotonin. And one of the symptoms of that is easy, easy flushing in the face, um, uh, basically thrombosis. You can see phlebitis, which is inflammation of the of the superficial veins and the and the blood vessels, uh, diarrhea, um, uh, mood disturbances, depression actually, and in extreme cases psychosis. So serotonin was known as something potentially very dangerous as early as the 1940s. They even even back then they knew that serotonin was the, uh, one of the primary factors, if not the primary factor, behind every fibrosis. Yet none of this made it into any kind of drugs. And it's the serotonin that was promoted as a cure for this, this, mostly for political reasons, because they noticed that at the time, this was like the early 60s, the civil rights movement and the hippie movement, the, the, the social justice movement in the United States, all the hippies were basically uh, heavily using drugs that were de- dopaminergic. And the, uh, the powers that be were concerned, the society is getting out of control, and these people cannot really be reasoned with that you cannot be, uh, they're, they're not following orders. And really, that, that's a nightmare for any, any politician in power. If the population is not following orders, then, uh, you, you know, to them, this is anarchy, right? How are we going to control 400 million people, 300 million people, if they're not following our orders? So they, they, they sponsored research which demonstrated that serotonin acts opposite to dopamine. So they said, oh, if all of, the, all of these dopaminergic drugs are driving people crazy, then maybe if we, if we give them serotonergic drugs, we're going to calm them down and we're going to make them, uh, you know, malleable and obedient. And that was very, very true. But that, that is never publicized. That the original impetus for the serotonin, the development of serotonergic drugs, was never to cure depression. In fact, it was known that serotonin could cause depression, but it was considered acceptable because it will calm people down, it will make them easy to control, peaceful, uh, loving, and whatnot. None of, them, none of this really uh, materialized except the obedience. Yes, serotonin is a very good way to make an organism obedient. You know why? Because it inhibits the production of energy. Multiple studies have shown that, that uh, animals that have poor metabolic function, poor mitochondrial function, are extremely submissive and obedient, uh, even in societies that don't really have hierarchies. So you, you, there are some animal societies that have extreme hierarchies, like, the, like ants or bees, right? But you have others that are more egalitarian, such as like the, you know, some, some types of apes, um, especially like uh, chimpanzees, bonobos are, are notorious being the most egalitarian probably species, the closest to us. But even in those species, it's, it's known that, that interfering with, with, the, with, the, uh, with the synthesis, with the production of energy, makes your organisms very obedient and subservient and willing to do just about anything that they're being asked to do or like forced to do. Um, and then that's what the that's what really the government sponsored in the 60s to come up with these drugs that will calm down the crazy hippies. And the pharmaceutical system obliged and basically produced these serotonergic drugs. And they said, well, um, you know, we need to come up with with a good sales pitch, right? And the sales pitch has to be convincing because it, sufficient portion of the medical uh, professionals already knew the serotonin could be dangerous. So they said, well, guess what? Yeah, it may be dangerous, but 
uh, it can cure depression. Uh, so first of all, the studies that, that showed that serotonergic drugs can cure depression, they, they, were, they, were, they had never been replicated. And most of the drugs that are on the market right now that are really known to be effective as antidepressants, turns out that most of these drugs are actually partial serotonin antagonists. And on top of everything, they increase the synthesis of protective neurosteroids in the brain, such as allopregnanolone or progesterone or pregnenolone. So now we know that, yes, these drugs are serotonergic and they're really dangerous, but more importantly, it turns out that their antidepressant effect had nothing to do with them increasing serotonin. If anything, it's to the contrary. Um, uh, I, uh, some people, sometimes people send me challenging emails that's like, oh, show me the evidence that dopamine cures depression. I'll tell you, go to Google, type dopamine agonist, and look at the Wikipedia page that shows up. It will give you about 20 of them. Click on every single link and you'll see that every single dopamine agonist, and keep in mind, dopamine and serotonin are inversely correlated. They largely block each other's effects. The hippies back in the 60s were using dopaminergic drugs. They didn't have any depression. They were pretty happy people by all accounts, right? So every single dopamine agonist drug in clinical use known is a potent antidepressant. Then go and type serotonin antagonist. And then they work similarly to dopamine, right? To dopamine agonist. So everything, everything that acts as a dopamine agonist is going to block the effects of serotonin indirectly. And then you have these drugs that are directly blocking serotonin effects. They're called serotonin antagonists. Check out the Wikipedia page about them. Every single one of them synthesized so far is, is known to have a potent antidepressant effect. And then go and check some serotonin agonists, not the uh, antidepressant drugs because they're known as SSRIs. They, pre they prevent the deactivation of serotonin, right? But find drugs that were developed specifically of serotonin agonists. In other words, drugs that can act like serotonin but cannot be deactivated, right? Every single one of them is known to have a side effect of psychosis, depression, fibrosis, sometimes terminal, cancer, emphysema, um, bone, uh, uh, bone uh, dissolution, osteopenia, osteoporosis, you name it, osteolytic really symptoms, um, uh, atrophy of the skin, atrophy of muscles. And you're like, oh, so why atrophy of muscles? As it turns out, serotonin and cortisol have a very intimate relationship. It looks like serotonin is the primary controller of the synthesis of, of cortisol in the body. So this means that serotonin is, it, is, it has an intimate participation in the stress system. Anything that promotes the synthesis of, of cortisol cannot be looked at as something benign, and most certainly not something whose activity or synthesis should be promoted. And as early as the 1950s, they, they, looked, they found out that you can use serotonin antagonists to treat the Cushing syndrome, which I mentioned earlier, which is a disease of cortisol excess. So that's the, so, but that's a, that's that's lowering cortisol indirectly. If you if you block serotonin or lower the effects of serotonin, that is a powerful way of telling the organism you're no longer under threat. It looks like, based on animal research and and publications on evolutionary biology, that serotonin is a very ancient hormone. Actually, it's neurotransmitter. And its primary purpose in the body is to signal threat. So when an organism is under threat, one of the first things that it does, it limits the non-crucial aspects of metabolism and, and the maintenance of non-crucial organs. So in other words, serotonin reverts you really back to the primitive state where the only thing maintained functional will be brain and heart and lungs and really some things that keep you barely alive, like a hibernating animal. Speaking of hibernating animal, it's the rise of serotonin that causes hibernation in every known animal that hibernates. If you, you, know, you have squirrels that hibernate, they're very well known, you have bears. So they've actually done the trials. If you inject deeply hibernating squirrels and bears with cyproheptalin or another serotonin antagonist, they immediately wake up. Uh, you know, the bear will try to eat you because it's hungry, right? The squirrel, like, you know, maybe acting disoriented a little bit, but it's waking up. It no longer wants to hibernate. Why? Because when you block serotonin, you're unleashing, you're removing the brakes on metabolism. So in other words, the body is like, oh, I'm good and ready to go again. Give me food because I need food to produce energy. So a great way to lose weight is to block serotonin or decrease its synthesis because not only it tells your body you're no longer under stress, but it says, uh, you know, I'm ready to go. Give me the energy because I will utilize it. Why would I utilize it? Well, if serotonin is low, 
cordial will be low, and you will not look like the lemon with sticks. I will not be using the food to store it as fat, which is a result of the stress signal. Really, when you're under stress, you're under threat, the body says, anything you put into that mouth, I'm going to use very little of it to keep you alive. Everything else, go back to storage, right? Which is the fatty tissue. So when you're blocking serotonin, you're really blocking a very primitive and ancient, perhaps the primary signal of threat, which is a type of stress, of course, as well. Uh, and the other cortisol blocking drug that I, uh, I actually had in mind when I mentioned the clinical trial for diabetes, is a drug that was developed as an abortion pill in the 1950s by a French company that has since been bought, I think, by Sanofi, and now it's owned by Roche. It's a Swiss pharmaceutical giant. And the drug is known as RU486. It's also known as Mifepristone, which uh, most people these days know it as the abortion pill. Why? Well, guess what? Here's an interesting story. Well, when Sanofi first developed the drug, they actually developed it as a glucocorticoid antagonist. In other words, a drug that blocks the effects of cortisol at the receptor. But at the time, there wasn't much of a market for cortisol antagonists. It's just not many people with Cushing syndrome. It was really a drug of largely academic interest. But because the cortisol receptor and the progesterone receptor, their structure is very similar, drugs that usually block one block the other as well. So they quickly realized, the scientists, the marketing officers at Sanofi, realized that they have a tremendous opportunity to market this drug as an abortion pill, especially with the rise of feminism and basically the, the movements for female equality and whatnot. They said, oh my God, we have a perfect opportunity to sell this as a birth control pill, essentially, instead of an anti-cortisol pill. Nobody was interested in anti-cortisol pills at the time. But never forget that RU486 was developed, designed, as a, gluco, as a cortisol receptor antagonist. It's only later when its, uh, its progesterone antagonism became known, and because you need the progesterone to maintain pregnancy, uh, anything that blocks the progesterone receptor will usually induce immediate abortion. So now they're using it as an abortion pill or emergency contraceptive pill, in, usually in combination with, uh, with, with, some, with either an estrogen or some other synthetic uh, steroid that prevents um, the, the implantation of the uh, of the of the of the fetus. So uh, so yeah. So blocking cortisol uh, either by decreasing serotonin, right, because it lowers the synthesis of cortisol as well, or blocking cortisol directly has very uh, very widespread systemic pro-metabolic anti-stress anti-aging effects. You can produce every symptom of aging by simply uh, providing the organism with an excessive amount of cortisol. You can create, there's a, there's a disease called progeria, which is a disease of accelerated aging um, in, in humans, but it, there are also several animal models developed that can mimic it because they want to study how it develops, right? And in order to do this in animals, you have to develop something that looks similar to the, the equivalent disease in humans. Guess what? They discovered they produce it in animals reliably by simply injecting them massive amounts of cortisol. So. It's cortisol, really, the relative excess of cortisol with aging and the declining levels of the anti-stress hormones such as progenolone, progesterone, DHA, testosterone, dihydrotestosterone. Really, those are the hormones that keep you young. Because why? Because they oppose the effects of cortisol. They oppose the effects of estrogen. They oppose the effects of prolactin. So they have a direct structurally protective effect because cortisol really dissolves you. As, a, as an organism. All it, can, all it can do is destroy all of your lean tissue and bones and promote the synthesis of fat. So clearly something that opposes that effect will, pro will like make you look better. You'll be lean, you'll be muscular. Um, speaking of which, uh, it, it turns out that the vast majority of anabolic androgenic steroids that the bodybuilders use, turns out that about 80% of their so-called anabolic effect is actually anti-catabolic effect. It's blocking the effects of cortisol. And recently, bodybuilders wisen up to the fact that this drug called IO486 exists, and they've started using it because it still is not banned in, in most competitions. So now if you go to like uh, Google and type bodybuilding space IO486, you're going to find thousands of threads of bodybuilders all over the world, mostly from the last three to four years, discussing what a great drug IO486 is because it is actually a steroid but it's not known as anabolic steroid, but it's now an anti-catabolic one. But guess what? It turns out that most of the benefits, muscular benefits that these steroids bodybuilders were abusing were actually due to simply blocking the effects of cortisol. 
So, Georgie, I want to briefly touch on um, one of your key products that you sell, uh, that you endorse or sell, um, and that is Lapidin. So that's obviously yeah. the, the, key, the key ingredient in Lapidin is Emodin. So do you want to talk briefly about some of the benefits of Emodin in the context of cortisol? Yeah, so uh, Emodin actually has multiple benefits, probably the primary one being that it's actually a quinone. So it, uh, it serves as an electron acceptor and most diseases, according to the metabolic theory, happen to do with the fact that you basically, of the three steps of metabolism, you're only using one. So, we, so the, if metabolism, if life really in general is the process of flow of electrons from food to oxygen, and then something is blocking that flow, and that's why disease develops, logical, uh, 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 I don't know, hypothesis would be that if you restore that flow somehow, then you'll be eliminating many of the health problems. Quinones do that because they accept these excess electrons that are coming from food, right? So if the, if the pathways are blocked, quinones can serve as an emergency electron acceptor and prevent the disease from happening and in many cases cure it. A modin just so happens to be a very powerful inhibitor of the enzyme 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1. Which is, which is the enzyme responsible for synthesizing cortisol from the relatively inactive precursor known as cortisol. So cortisol has a ketone group on position 11, while cortisol has a hydroxyl group on position 11. And that tiny little change makes all the difference and makes cortisol an extremely potent glucocorticoid, while cortisol actually, its precursor, happens to be a relatively antagonistic. So it's not as potent as RU486, but it still serves to balance the, the effects of cortisol in the body. And if that enzyme, 11 beta HSD1, is overexpressed or working in, in overdrive, you're going to be synthesizing a ton of cortisol with all of the negative effects that that entails. Emodin happens to be the most potent natural inhibitor of that enzyme, and actually not even natural. They've been trying to synthesize synthetic, in other words, artificial, uh, analogs of emodin that will inhibit that enzyme and to my knowledge nothing's really been synthesized that that, that that comes that actually manages to beat how potent emodin is so just a few milligrams of emodin are sufficient to inhibit the activity of that enzyme by more than 50 percent and now given that mainstream medicine has started to wisen up um, about the role of cortisol um, in in almost any disease but especially type 2 diabetes remember Cortisol makes you store fat in the middle and makes you lose muscle mass and makes you look like a lemon with sticks. That's how people with type 2 diabetes look. So uh, the thinking goes, maybe if we block cortisol or inhibit its synthesis, we're going to be able to reverse this pathology. Voila, that's exactly what they did. So if you go to Google and type 11-beta HSD1 inhibitor diabetes, you will get a ton of studies most of them were synthetic inhibitors because they, they're patented, they're expensive and whatnot. But guess what? There are also studies with emodin. And yes, there are animal studies, but now there's actually a clinical trial going on. I'm not sure. They may be actually in Australia or Canada. I know it was, a, I know it was like, a, like a Commonwealth member. And basically, they're using emodin, isolated emodin, um, to actually see if it's going to either relieve the obesity or maybe potentially even improve the whole diabetic state of people with type 2 diabetes. But the animal evidence from animal uh, studies with emodin is overwhelming going back at least 30 years. So if you can't find isolated emodin, you can do cascara. Unfortunately, the cascara products on the market are uh, it's very difficult to ascertain the quality because really good quality cascara is very expensive because it's actually uh, extract from a bark. So many people, many vendors out there, especially importing it from China, will basically sell you this powder, um, and the amount of emodin in the bark actually uh, depends on the environment that the tree has been growing into. And it's known that if there's drought, if the tree doesn't get sufficient water, or if it's basically there's, it's been sprayed with pesticides, etc., you actually, the amount of emodin in the bark will drastically decrease. So in many cases, if you're, if you're using uh, Cascara Sagrada bark products, you won't be getting much of an emodin. That's one of the reasons why we developed Lapotin, because you're actually getting the purified emodin, which is the main active ingredient in Cascara. And Cascara has been studied for a very long time. Nothing else has come out as a potentially active ingredient. It's really only the emodin that's giving it all of the benefits that, that they're known. 
pro-digestive, pro-motility, anti-inflammatory, pro-metabolic, and of course, anti-cortisol. Terrific. I'll be, um, for those listening in, I'll be linking uh, Lapidon in the show notes for people to check out. That's at ideallabs.dc. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, Georgie, and this is probably the final, because we've got to wrap up soon, but the final thing I wanted to point out that you mentioned on your website, which is phenomenal, um, is the negative association of DHT with prostate cancer. Yeah. So, so uh, that's another theory that we've been sold on to. Um, and it turns out it's um, mostly fraud, actually. It's not even negligence because they had a drug to sell and they, uh, the estrogen industry wanted to expand its market by giving estrogen not only to women but also to men. Um, I don't think I don't think I need to advertise it to men and tell them that uh, having high estrogen in the male is really not beneficial. I mean, you develop boobs. <laughs> it's called it's called gynecomastia. It's really basically a condition indistinguishable for having female breasts. Um, and in fact, many transgender people that are that are uh, converting from males to females, they will actually go on a very high dose estrogen and progesterone therapy, but the, uh, to give them themselves breasts. But the, 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 the factor most responsible for breast growth is the estrogen. So it doesn't seem like something that's good, is good to give males, right? But the estrogen industry is relentless and it wanted to double its market. So it was not enough that they were selling estrogen pills to menopausal women or to child, women of childbearing and age as a contraceptive. They wanted to now give it to males. So they used the well-known correlation, uh, not, not correlation, but the well-known effects the DHT has on the prostate, it makes it grow. Yes, it does. Um, because it's actually an organ with a very high expression of the androgen receptor. So it's very sensitive to potent androgens. DHT is the most potent androgen we produce. It's synthesized on testosterone, but testosterone is about five to eight times weaker as an androgen agonist than DHT. So DHT is really what's making us males. So uh, it has this effect of masculinizing the face, masculinizing the face, the uh, facial features, the body, uh, basically giving you the V shape. Um, and then it's responsible for things like penis length, uh, for, for bone strength, really truly like uh, the male sexual phenotype. Um, and they, they use this, the fact that in animal studies they've shown that, and also in humans later on they found out that, that uh, elevated levels of DHT make the prostate grow. They said, oh, well, um, one of the first things that we see before prostate cancer develops is that these people usually go through a stage called BPH, benign prostate hyperplasia. They, they said it's a risk for, for prostate cancer. It has never been proven that actually it will progress to prostate cancer. It's never been proven that it has any causal relationship whatsoever. But they said, no, DHT really enlarges your prostate. We actually we need, we need, to comp we need to develop a treatment for it. And what do they do? They developed something called chemical castration therapy. For it, and it's really, that's how it's known to this day officially. It used to be a combination of physical and chemical castration, but many men started balking at the idea of having their bones cut off. So they said, um, we're not going to be able to sell many men on that surgery. Might as well develop something that's, that's you know, they can do it chemically. But it, don't make no mistake. You may be keeping your, your nuts down there, your nuggets, but they're not working anymore when they give you the chemical castration drugs. And those chemical castration drugs are drugs that either inhibit the synthesis of DHT. Uh, they're known as 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, the most notorious one being finasteride. And that's a whole separate story of just how many lives finasteride has ruined. Now there are actually massive class action lawsuits being prepared in America to sue the manufacturers of finasteride, which lie to people saying, oh, it's perfectly safe. You don't need DHT. Testosterone is perfectly sufficient to maintain you as a male. Uh, as it turns out, not. Not only not, but hell not. Yeah. It leads to depression, leads to suicide, it leads to feminization, leads to liver cancer, leads to uh, prostate cancer. Actually, a very aggressive type of prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is perhaps the one cancer where even a mainstream doctor, if you're an older male, and you go to them, they will give you a test. Uh, they even may do a biopsy. And and usually if you have the so-called uh, hormone-sensitive, uh, non-aggressive type, they'll tell you the best course of uh, action is doing nothing. Actually, the doctor for prostate cancer will tell you in the vast majority of cases, the prostate cancer develops so slowly, you're likely to die of natural causes earlier than the cancer will kill you. But guess what? If you take finasteride, it has a very high chance of converting that 
mostly slow growing, really non dangerous cancer into an extremely nasty type known as castration resistant prostate cancer, which is known to be in, uh, you know, resistant to any kind of really of chemotherapy. So the only options are they are removing your entire prostate, which renders you immediately both impotent and incontinent for life, if you even survive it, because it's not a simple surgery. And then basically, if that fails, then radiation is your only chance. But still, prostate uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer is considered almost universally lethal. And guess what? The finasteride drug is known to cause it. So, so they said, oh, that's not enough. We need another type of therapy. What are we, what are we going to do, uh, do to further decrease the amount of androgens being produced because they're really causing prostate cancer? We're going to give them an estrogen. So now, actually, the mainstream therapy for prostate cancer very often is a combination of a synthetic estrogen and finasteride. So not only are they depriving you of almost everything that makes you a male, they're kind of sending you well on your way to becoming a female. Uh, I've seen some men who have undergone uh, castration therapy with estrogen or, or finasteride or both. The results are not pleasant, especially the combination therapy. They start looking like women. Um, um, I don't know how many of your listeners are following American celebrity news, but there is this famous Kardashian family in California, um, and uh, the father actually the, it's the second husband of the of the woman that's participating in the show. But he recently converted from a male to female, and uh, and he he published he basically like in several interviews they asked him look so how did this happen usually gender dysphoria like wanting to be something other than your biological gender if, if you are born a male but you, with male genitals but you want to be a female that usually starts to develop very early in puberty you are in your sixties how did you suddenly become how did you suddenly decide you wanted to become a woman. He said, well, I don't know. It was just a very strong urge. And I actually started physically looking like a woman, which was true. So I thought to myself, and just immediately by seeing like, that guy has either been exposed to some really potent endocrine disruptors like bisphenol A, which is heavily feminizing in males, or he has taken one of those drugs. And lo and behold, he said that he's been on finasteride therapy for almost 10 years. And, and then they, he never put the two, two together in the interview. I mean, but he mentioned he was on this therapy. And I said, what a great coincidence. You take finasteride for 10 years, and suddenly in your 60s, you decided you want to be a woman, actually convert as a woman, right? After living your whole life as a heterosexual male, and, you know, having sex with women by virtue of your own desire, create, beginning three children of your own, physically, right? I mean, this to me should be enough to trigger some deep retrospection and say, hold on a second, what happened to that guy to suddenly start looking like a woman, wanting to be a woman, and then undergoing all of these gender converting surgeries? And then the only thing that I know, unless, I mean, he didn't mention anything else, right? The only thing uh, is that he said he's been taking finasteride for a, lo for a very long time. Well, knowing the anti-androgenic, castration effects of finasteride, I probably don't need to tell you listeners that eunuchs, the castrated males, they look like females. So that's what this drug does. It converts you into a eunuch without actually you losing your genitals physically. And there's the example, you know, at least one very high profile example. Bruce Jenner is his name. And now it's known as Caitlin. Yeah, <clears throat> just it's, it's honestly it's shocking, shocking to hear. Um, and every time, every time I hear people discuss finasteride in different communities and like anti-aging forums and all that, I'm just, I honestly just question like, have they even seen the repercussions? And not only when they're on the drug, but even years after stopping, there's guys that are yeah. struggling to bounce back. And, you know, five years later, they're still got you know, major side effects. So it's, again, another myth. If you, if you don't believe, if they don't believe, simply go to the law and type finasteride class action lawsuits. And you'll see it. I mean, look, if thousands, tens of thousands of men are ganging up and getting ready to sue the hell out of the pharmaceutical industry, and, you know, this doesn't happen unless there is very serious evidence because the lawyers will not pick up the case. If the lawyers are going after it and agreeing to defend these men pro bono, Lawyers are thinking there is some serious money to be made. There is a very, very strong evidence 
implicated in Finastro and all of these problems that these men have been plagued with years, sometimes decades after using Finastro, even a short course therapy, like a month or two months, you know, people sense something is wrong and they stopped it, but the drug already did its damage and now they're either impotent, uh, they're infertile, they develop liver problems, they're suicidal, they're major depression, anything you can come up with that, that, that plagues a male, it can be tied usually to some sort of androgen deficiency. It's not a coincidence that androgen therapy used to be one of the first things that a family doctor would try in the early 20th century. Like basically they're saying like, uh, oh, if you're feeling sluggish, no interest in sex, quite obvious, right? That's a, you know, androgen therapy will, will be useful for that, but like mood disorders, like bones are getting weak, muscles are getting weak, you, you're not, you, don't, you don't feel pleasure in life anymore, your cholesterol is going up, your heart, you know, your heart is not working properly. The, actually, testosterone therapy was a very, very common treatment, you know, for all of these these, these treatments, of all these, for all these issues. And we've been somehow, we became convinced because of pharmaceutical manipulation that the opposite is good for us. Let's, you know what, let's lower androgens even more. Let's see how that goes. Well, you're seeing the results. Um, so I'm glad that actually somebody's finally taken the fight to the pharmaceutical companies because this has been going on for way too long. Way too many lives have been ruined. The only thing that needs to happen now to make this truly, truly like a worldwide beneficial event is for the prostate cancer patients to realize that finasteride has also ruined their lives as well, not simply the lives of the men who took the drug for baldness problems, or you know, or or uh, prostate enlargement problems, but now the problem is the prostate cancer patients join forces with all of the the other users of the drug finasteride that took it for other reasons. I think then you may you may have like a very very uh, um, uh, you know worldwide impactful change of of health policy because those will be tens of millions of patients around the world who are saying enough of this. You know, I want my life back. I don't want to be castrated. Um, and I don't want my relatively benign prostate cancer to be turned into a killer cancer uh, for which you guys have no treatment. And even if you did have a treatment, it renders me fully impotent and fully incontinent. And what kind of life is this? I, I mean, I, mean, I, know, I think a good portion of the males, when they hear what, what awaits them with these treatments, they're probably going to say, you know what? How about you leave me alone and I'm going to die with dignity and not live like a castrated slime that has no joy in whatsoever left in life. No dignity. Powerful stuff there, Georgie. Yeah. Well, um, we're actually, we're running short on time. So we're going to have to probably, we'll definitely schedule another episode down the line. Sure, sure. Particularly, particularly around a lot of the um, interventions and things and some of the protocols that I see you recommend and um, some strategies to lower cortisol, boost androgen status, for example. I mean, I, I, I saw a huge benefit from, you know, like I said, utilizing high dose vitamin B1 at one stage, you know, that, that was a game changer right. for mental clarity and DHT for a fact. Um, niacin had some huge success niacin, with that. Yeah. Like some of these compounds you mentioned, I've, I've derived a lot of benefit from. So just before we wrap up, Georgie, um, did you want to let my listeners know where they can find more of your content? Yes. Uh, I uh, used to post and I still post a lot on the raypeteforum.com. So Ray Pete is the name of, you know, Raymond Pete, Ray Pete forum, one word.com. Uh, but I also now have my own blog uh, and I post what I was posting on the Ray Pete forum and I still do. Uh, my alias there was Hayden, H is in Harry, A, I, D is in dog, U, T is in Tom. And Hayden were basically this group of rebels back in Bulgaria, which where I'm originally from and they were fighting the, the oppressive uh, presence of the Ottoman Empire. So in a sense, it's a rebel without a cause. I think there's a song like that. Uh, I, I would like to think of myself as one, right? So Heydut is my, my online alias, and I have a blog, which is heydut.me, M-E. So uh, usually the blog is, is the blog that has the, the most recent content that I've posted, and that blog is also linked to my Twitter account, which is twitter.com slash and anything I post on the blog almost immediately gets post gets reposted on Twitter. And a little bit later, about a week later, I take everything from the blog and I also post on the Ray P4. Uh, but usually the blog and the Twitter are enough to be like to keep abreast with like the latest that I've that I've done and posted. And that's pretty much it. I mean, we have a company for several months, but I think we should, we should probably discuss that like on the next on the next podcast. Sure, man. 
Well, thanks everyone for joining in. And Georgie, I want to say a massive thanks for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure having you here. And of course, like, I mean, you've influenced my journey hugely where I am today and even how I help millions of people, you know, millions of people through my social media and things like that. So, you know, I've learned, I've learned a lot from what you've taught, not only like what you've, you know, expressed on a Ray B forum, but then also delving into my own research and understanding human physiology and yeah i just want to say that i'm very grateful for the work that you do and um just keep fighting the good fight yeah man thank you appreciate it i will as long as i have people interested in my work that's what keeps me going uh you know we uh situation is pretty dire but also we live in unprecedented times because now all of this information that used to be hidden and only accessible uh, by the powers that be you have to be a licensed doctor you used to be a, have to be a licensed doctor to read a medical journal now almost everything is publicly it, it's online um and with the websites like sci-hub now you have access to almost any publication over the last hundred years um, and you don't need to be a doctor or you don't need a license to be able to search for and access the truth it's only up to you um and as we have learned the hard way uh basically when you when you offload or outsource so much of your life uh, changing decisions to third parties very often these parties get into a position of power, absolute power, and they'll say, I don't want to relinquish that power, I want to control that individual. And I'm going to tell them what's good for them, what's healthy and what's not, and I'm going to, I'm going to keep them in the dark. So that's, that's the situation we're in right now, but we also have the unprecedented opportunity to find the truth because actually it is out there. It's simply not promoted, but it's up to us to go and find it because it has been published and it has been published for more than 100 years. So that's the positive side of the story for me. Fantastic. Thanks again, Georgie. And um, we'll wrap it up there. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.